Hello and uh, welcome to this video presentation of the Walk Through the Bible Study and Discipleship Ministry of Southside United Methodist Church in Jacksonville, Florida. My name is Robbie Parks and I'll be leading today's lesson from God's Word in the Old Testament, first book, book of 1 Samuel. So as we open uh, our Bibles today, uh, let's begin with a word of prayer and ask for guidance of the Holy Spirit during our study. Heavenly Father, you send your Spirit among us and grant us the illumination of these words of Scripture, that they might be used in our lives to shape us and mold us into the people you would have us to be. Teach us, rebuke us, correct us and train us in righteousness and prepare us for every good work. In Jesus' name, amen. So I said, we're in the book of 1 Samuel, being in chapter 4 today, beginning at the first verse of chapter 4. This uh, concerns the capture of the Ark of God. Chapter 3 began with a notice of the rarity of the Word of God uh, in Samuel's day, but it ended with a pronouncement of a change in the availability of God's revelation due to the Lord's calling of Samuel and Samuel's being established as a prophet of the Lord. Once again, the Lord revealed himself by his word to Samuel at the tabernacle at Shiloh, and there seemed to be hope of revival for Israel after the dark days of the judges. And although chapter 4, verse 1, begins with a hopeful note, and the word of the Lord, and the word of Samuel, pardon me, and the word of Samuel came to all Israel, it must be remembered that the customs of the people in the days of the judges still lingered. Eli was still the acting judge and high priest of Israel. Many of the same old problems and sinful tendencies remained. We must also remember the words of the Lord to Samuel in chapter 3 and to the man of God in chapter 2 that God was about to bring judgment and destruction upon the house of Eli. We will see this quickly as we delve into chapter 4. Let's remember our history lesson from the Old Testament book of Judges. God repeatedly gave Israel into the hands of its enemies. For example, the Moabites, the Syrians, and the Midians to punish and oppress Israel for their persistent apostasy and their sin. The oppressors would cause the people to cry out to the Lord in their misery and return to him seeking his mercy. And then God would raise up an obedient judge to lead the people and defeat Israel's enemies and restore their peace. Essentially, here at the opening of chapter 4, it appears we have a reiteration of that same pattern. God made it clear that his anger was aroused with Israel and with the house of Eli for their misconduct in the priesthood. As the sovereign Lord of history has done ever since the dawn of time, he will use pagan and godless allies to accomplish his will and to carry out his judgments for him. One of those godless allies and a perennial enemy of Israel were the Philistines. Philistines will figure prominently in many places in the books of 1st and 2nd Samuel. The earliest historical references to the Philistines are found in some Egyptian texts from the 12th century. B.C., about 100 years prior to the events of 1 Samuel. They are named among a group of peoples called the Sea Peoples, and they dwelt on the coastal plain of Canaan. They were ruled by an alliance of five city-states named Gath, Gaza, Ashkelon, Ekron, and Ashdod. You'll see those marked on the text here on the map on the right hand side uh, with a bold underline. And this is how the text reads. Now Israel went out to battle against the Philistines. 
they encamped at Ebenezer, and the Philistines encamped at Aphek. The Philistines drew up in line against Israel, and when the battle spread, Israel was defeated by the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 men on the field of battle. Now, the Bible says the site of the battle was uh, near Aphek. Aphek was a, located just across the Yarkon River, uh, about eight miles east of modern-day Tel Aviv. An ancient Philistine city has actually been excavated there. About two miles to the east of Aphek was the Israelite town of Ebenezer, not far from Shiloh. You'll see those highlighted as well on the map, both Aphek and Shiloh. It was in Ebenezer where the army of Israel encamped. Soon the battle broke out and the results were disastrous for the Jews. Israel was defeated by the Philistines who killed about 4,000 men on the field of battle. Having thought the Lord would be on their side as his chosen people, the leaders of Israel were aghast and astonished at their defeat. Let's read the next text here. And when the troops came to the camp, the elders of Israel said, why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? Why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? Let us bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord here from Shiloh, that it may come among us and save us from the power of our enemies. So the people sent to Shiloh and brought from there the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of Hosts, who is enthroned on the cherubim. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. See a picture of the Ark there on the right. Um, that uh, gives you an idea of uh, what it may have looked like. The uh, golden cherubim uh, are, uh, are visible on top. Uh, and uh, this is um, what uh, Hophni and Phinehas took into the battle. Now, the um, early in the covenant people's history, as the text said, the elders of, it spoke of the elders of Israel. The elders of Israel were a loosely knit confederation of tribal leaders, usually 70 in number, uh, who were entrusted with important decisions. Over the centuries, this group usually had eventually evolved into the Sanhedrin, the 70 member Sanhedrin that we read about in the uh, New Testament gospel accounts. The elders had wisdom enough to recognize the involvement of their sovereign God in this disastrous outcome, acknowledging that the Lord has defeated us today before the Philistines. But their reasoning fell apart after that. The elders should have sought the guidance of the Lord and his word, perhaps from the prophet Samuel, but since the word of the Lord was rare in those days, as it says in chapter 3, verse 1, they relied on their own judgment, and as was common in the era of the judges, every man did what was right in his own eyes. The elders landed on the idea of bringing the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord to the battle versus the Philistines and sent to Shiloh to get the Ark and presumably the sanction of Eli, the high priest. Regrettably, they didn't consult Samuel, but the prophet of the Lord. The Ark was certainly to be regarded as a most holy object. It was the Ark's presence behind the inner veil of the tabernacle that made the Holy of Holies most holy. Uh, but the Ark of the Covenant was basically just a box of acacia wood with hammered gold over it and having an ornate cast golden lid with the forms of two cherubim sculpted into it, as you saw in the picture. Beneath that lid, however, were the two tablets of stone that Moses had put in there on which was engraved the law of God and the covenant uh, with Israel. 
The images of the two worshiping genuflecting cherubim on top signified the appointed place of God's enthronement and his uh, meeting place with his people. Uh, however, God's real throne was in heaven and it, the ark was not to be used as a good luck talisman or some sort of secret weapon as the elders of Israel may have been thinking at that time. The author of 1 Samuel refers to the ark as the ark of the covenant of the Lord of hosts who is enthroned upon the cherubim. The very complete description of the ark, uh, the holy name Lord of hosts in Hebrew is Yahweh Sabaoth, meaning Lord of armies. Simply having the Lord's Ark, however, without the presence of the Lord and his armies of angels was no guarantee of victory for anyone. But it is no surprise that the two sons, Hoth of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, bought into the elders' flawed reason and theological ignorance and were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. This would prove to be their final undoing. Things seem to be going well at first, however. Let's take a look. The text reads, As soon as the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came into camp, all Israel gave a mighty shout, so that the earth resounded. And when the Philistines heard the noise of the shouting, they said, What does this great shouting in the camp of the Hebrews mean? And when they learned that the ark of the Lord had come into the camp, the Philistines were afraid, for they had said, A God has come into their camp. And they said, Woe to us. Nothing like this has happened before. Woe to us. Who can deliver us from the power of these mighty gods? These are the gods who struck the Egyptians with every sort of plague in the wilderness. Take courage and be men, O Philistines lest you become slaves to the Hebrews as they have been to you. Be men and fight. The mighty shout given by the Israelites as soon as the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came into the camp must have made for a great pep rally. But their boisterous confidence was misplaced by their having focused on the Ark as a cultic object instead of on the Lord Yahweh. It was a sense of worshipful awe and respectful obedience that was lacking among the Israelites and especially among the two young priests, Tophni and Phinehas. The Lord was most assuredly not with their camp as he had been years before with Moses when the ark was carried forth from Sinai or with Joshua when the priests stood with the ark in the ford of the Jordan River to part the waters or when they marched it around the city of Jericho. But ironically, the Philistines held Israel's God in more fearful esteem uh, than the covenant people seemed to. Although they did not truthfully know Yahweh or revere his holiness, they knew he was a mighty God above all other gods. And they cried out, woe to us, who can deliver us from the power of this my these mighty gods? These are the gods that struck the Egyptians with every sort of plague in the wilderness. The pagans of that day subscribed to the notion that their gods were regionalized, uh, that uh, to, to the territory belonging to their people. The fact that the God of Israel had manifest himself and given victory uh, to Israel from the land of Egypt across the Sinai Peninsula and into Canaan demonstrated a, deg a degree of divine transcendence that the Philistines had taken notice of. They girded themselves for a terrible battle and summoned all their courage that they had and um, that they would be men and fight lest they become slaves to the Hebrews. Well, here's what happened. So the Philistines fought and Israel was defeated and they fled every man to his home. And there was a very great slaughter for there fell of Israel 30,000 foot soldiers 
and the ark of God was captured. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, died. If the first defeat was a setback for Israel, the second described here was a disaster. The Philistines fought fiercely and bravely. The armies of Israel were defeated and fled in disgraceful retreat. The casualties were tragic. There fell of Israel 30,000 foot soldiers. Furthermore, among the Ark's casualties were the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, who had both died on the same day as it had been prophesied by the man of God. For Samuel chapter 2, verse 35, you can look that up. And if, all was not tra if that was not tragic enough, the greater and more unthinkable tragedy had also taken place. The Ark of God was captured by the Philistine army. This devastating news must be told in Shiloh. Let's take a look. The text reads, A man of Benjamin ran from the battle line and came to Shiloh the same day with his clothes torn and with dirt on his head. When he arrived, Eli was sitting on his seat by the road, watching, for his heart trembled for the ark of God. And when the man came into the city and told the news, all the city cried out. And when Eli heard the sound of the outcry, he said, what is this uproar? Then the man hurried and came and told Eli. Now, Eli was 98 years old and his eyes were set so that he could not see. It's an odd that a specific description should be made of this Israelite messenger to Shiloh, calling him a man of Benjamin. Perhaps it adds a sense of realism, although no name is given for him. Rabbinic tradition is often held that this Benjamite messenger was Saul, the son of Kish, Israel's future king. There's no real textual support for, for that idea, but nonetheless, this man of Benjamin ran from the battle and came to Shiloh on the same day, a distance of nearly 20 miles. He arrived bearing all the signs of bad news, rent clothing and dirt on his head. The tearing of clothing was a common reaction to grief in the Old Testament. And putting dirt or ashes on one's head was also a similar reaction to calamity and a sign of penitence and supplication to the Lord. These signs of anguish over the defeat were likewise exhibited by Israel's leader Joshua following his defeat in the Battle of Ai. We're told that Eli was waiting anxiously by the road for news of the battle because his heart trembled for the ark of the Lord. Plainly, the old man had misgivings about the whole plan, especially due to the involvement of his two wayward and impenitent sons. We can see in Eli that his sin was probably not so much his lack of godly discernment, but his weakness and his cowardice in failing to act on what he knew he should do. The Benjamite's entrance to Shiloh apparently took him first to the main gate of the city and not to the tabernacle where Eli was waiting. The man told the news to the townspeople and all the city cried out. Eli heard the sound of the outcry and inquired what was the uproar, probably fearing the worst. We are given Eli's age at this point, 98 years old, and told that he had become blind and he could no longer see. He was obviously in frail condition to receive such bad news. 1 Samuel 4, verses 16 through 18 read like this. And the man said to Eli, I am he who has come from the battle. I fled from the battle today. And he said, how did it go, my son? He who brought the news answered and said, Israel has fled before the Philistines, and there has also been a great defeat among the people. 
Your two sons also, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the Ark of God has been captured. The man told the tragic news to Eli of the capture of the Ark and the death of both of his sons and the devastating defeat of Israel. Given the prophetic words of God's coming judgment that uh, Eli had heard, the old man would have had to have recognized that their fulfillment had begun. It overwhelmed the old priest and his head was reeling. The, the death of his two sons had already been foretold, but the loss of God's holy ark represented to Eli as high priest, the most disgraceful act of negligent sacrilege the old man could have imagined. Verse 18 describes Eli's response to the news. As soon as he mentioned the ark of God, Eli fell over backward from his seat by the side of the gate, and his neck was broken, and he died, for the man was old and heavy, and he had judged Israel for 40 years. But though Eli's death ended his tenure as high priest and judge in Israel, it did not end the carrying out of God's wrath against his descendants. God had vowed that all the descendants of Eli's house shall die by the sword of men. For Samuel 2, verse 33, and that the Lord was about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God and he did not restrain them. For Samuel 3, verse 33, that curse was at work in the next section of the text. Now Eli's daughter-in-law, the wife of Phinehas, was pregnant, about to give birth. And when she heard the news that the ark of God was captured and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bowed and gave birth, for her pains had come upon her. And about the time of her death, the women attending to her said, Do not be afraid, for you have borne a son. And she did not answer or pay attention. And she named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory has departed from Israel, because the ark of God had been captured, and because of her father-in-law and her husband. And she said, The glory has departed from Israel, for the ark of God has been captured. This part of the story is a painful and tragic epitaph to Eli's regime as high priest of Israel. His negligent and corrupt administration of the sacrifices and offerings of the tabernacle of the Lord brought great sorrow to his family and to all Israel. The irony in the account of the death of the wife of Phinehas is that her grief seems to stem less from the death of her husband and her father-in-law than from the loss of the ark. The abode of the ark of the, in the tabernacle was the place where God had ordained that he would manifest his glory among the Israelites. With her dying breath, the grieving mother cried out twice in heartbroken lament, the glory has departed from Israel. So profound was her grief for God's people that she commemorated the shameful event by naming her son Ichabod, or Ichabod, no glory. It's true in one sense that we are never totally bereft of the glory of God, of our omnipresent God, if we have eyes of faith to see it. The psalmist David declared that the heavens declare the glory of God in Psalm 19.1. And the cherubim that the prophet Isaiah beheld in his vision in the temple cried out continually, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Heaven and earth are filled with his glory, Isaiah 6.3. But the departed glory lamented by the dying wife of Phinehas was the manifest 
glory of God, his palpable, holy, and sometimes visible presence among his people. It was the glory sought after by Moses when he pleaded with the Lord on Sinai, on Mount Sinai, show me your glory, in Exodus 33, verse 18. And God had decreed to Moses that he would manifest his glory within the camp of Israel, within the tabernacle, behind the veil of the Holy of Holies, enthroned in brilliance and refulgence above the wings of the golden cherubim atop the Ark of the Covenant. But God's true throne room is in heaven, and he could abandon his earthly throne when the sin of the people grew too great. The Lord removed his manifest glory from Israel once again before the fall of Jerusalem when the prophet Ezekiel beheld his departure and his beatific vision. And although God would manifest his glory in Israel again during the days of David and Solomon, this removal of his glory and of the ark was another aspect of judgment from God for the sins of Eli's priesthood and of the people. The departure of God's glory, his manifest presence among his people, was indeed a tragedy. I say that the removal of God's glory was a judgment because it deprived Israel of its greatest good. This is why the woman grieved as she did. God's glory, his kavod, his gravity, his weightiness, drives men to their knees and causes them to see themselves as the sinners that they are, and at the same time reveals the transcendent majesty of God as the one holy, good, and righteous Lord of all creation. Although there is no longer a temple or a tabernacle or an ark, there is still good news for those who long for the glory of God. We know that God has torn down the veil that shielded Israel and its priests from the glory in the Holy of Holies. God has put his glory in our midst. John, the evangelist, put it like this, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. It's John 1, 14. We often hear that verse read at Christmas time. That's right. The glory of God is ours to approach by fixing our eyes in faith upon Jesus Christ, the Word of God made flesh. The writer of Hebrews expressed it this way. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. Get this, he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his being. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Jesus Christ, it's the glory of God. Let it be our prayer today that we will seek the glory of God as Moses sought it when he asked the Lord to show it to him and to be hidden in the cleft of the rock. Let us seek the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Dear God, help us to fix our eyes upon Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. He's gone before us. He's finished the work that had to be done to reveal your glory among your people. Oh, give us eyes of faith that we might see it. Give us hearts full of repentance for our sins and our neglects. 
Give us a heart full of love and a heart that longs for your glory, a long heart that longs to encounter the Lord Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, the radiance, the glory of God. Amen.